So as we're moving forward now, we're going to move into respiratory system. So little different than we've been doing vascular stuff and immune stuff. Now we're going to do breathing stuff. And so we're going to talk about the anatomy of what goes on. We're going to talk about how gases and partial pressures affect our ability to get oxygen to our cells and remove carbon dioxide from our body. So when we look at the respiratory system, you probably have encountered this term, upper respiratory. What usually follows upper respiratory when you hear it? Infection. infection. You have an upper respiratory infection. And that's because your upper respiratory tract is going to be basically your throat and up, nose, nasal cavity, and your pharynx, which is the back of the throat. So that's upper respiratory. Now that's, it's not comfortable to get, but it's not really horrible either, right? What, what do you not want to end get? Lower respiratory, those are much more difficult to treat and get rid of. And you got a whole list of things here, but basically it's everything below the pharynx. The larynx is where your vocal cords are. It's also going to be at the point where you have the little flap called the epiglottis. The trachea is the tube then that connects the larynx down to the lungs through all of these levels of branches that are going to get down to these little tiny bubbles called alveoli that are extremely thin. They're so thin, gases can diffuse across them. And that's where we're going to exchange gases. Now, I say all the branches. I think there's like 23 generations of branches. We're not going to name them all. So we can look at this organization just based on anatomy. But we can also look at the organization of respiratory tract based on function. Because the upper part of our respiratory tract, from our nose way down into these generation of branches, are called the conducting zone. Because all that's happening in these passageway is air is conducted in and out. No gases can be exchanged because number one, the walls of the airways are too thick. Diffusion's not going to happen. And secondly, you don't have a high density of capillaries associated with them. So even if it could diffuse across, the capillaries aren't there to pick it up. Because remember, we're getting oxygen out of the air and into the blood. And what are the only blood vessels that will allow exchange? Y'all are going to remember that the rest of your life. <laughs> so you've got to have capillaries associated with those little alveoli for that exchange to happen. And vice versa with carbon dioxide. So the conducting zone does not have capillaries? The conducting zone has capillaries only to feed the cells of the conducting zone but you're not going to exchange gases with the blood, okay? Not as the respiratory system overall. All you're doing is moving the air from the outside environment down to the level where you could begin to exchange gases, and that's called the respiratory zone. There we see the alveoli. Uh, each one of those little grapes, those little bubbles, that's an alveoli. When they're clustered together, they're in a sac that's just made up of alveoli. That's called an alveolar sac. We're going to have a portion maybe right here in the beginning that are alveoli that are arranged sort of in a rod with a hollow center. That's called an alveolar duct. And then once we get right up here, we have this bronchiole. You remember how we had arteries? Okay, elastic arteries, muscular arteries. And then when they got smaller, what did we call them? Arteriole, something that's a ole, I-O-L-E, means smaller. So here we have a bronchiole, a bronchus bronchi are big, bronchioles are small. And here, this is a respiratory bronchiole. It's basically a passageway that has a couple of alveoli stuck on it. 
And that's the first place where you can start exchanging a little bit of gas. And that respiratory bronchial is going to be the first passageway that we're going to call the respiratory zone. And it ends at the alveoli. Again, some of this is pretty basic, but if we don't start laying out the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, the puzzle itself is not going to make sense and we'll never get it all put together. So that's what we're working with from an anatomical and a functional standpoint. Now, what was one of the reasons I said we couldn't exchange gases in the conducting zone? Too thick. Now, what's too thick about it is our epithelium. And when you begin to put your epithelium together with connective tissue, then we start referring to it by the term mucosa, which is a layer. And so the inner layer of our passageways, our plumbing in this case, or our ductwork, since we're talking about air, is the mucosal layer. And it's going to be adjacent to the lumen. Do we understand what lumen is? The hollow center of a hollow passageway or hollow organ. So our mucosa is going to be that that is associated with the air. And as we move further down from our trachea all the way down to respiratory bronchioles, that mucosa is going to get thinner and thinner or, or flatter and flatter and flatter, however you want to look at it. And we're going to kind of change some of the cell types that we have there because the function is going to be different in our trachea and our nasal passages than it is in the alveoli. So with this mucosa, you can see our epithelium and all epithelium are going to be sitting on top of a what? Basement membrane. Basement membrane. That basement membrane is going to be that foundation for our epithelium. Then in a mucosa layer where we get to the connective tissue, we're going to call that the lamina, which is layer, the lamina propria. And you can see that bracket in our illustration. And we've got this sort of loose connective tissue, some blood vessels in there. That's going to be our mucosal layer of our respiratory tract. Now, this is kind of generically what we're working with. Now, let's, let's look at, we're, we're going to do a little histology here, okay? So you'll be prepared for lab when you get to it. So, as we get thinner and thinner when we start up at the top and move down, our thickest layer and where we're in the, the nasal cavities and we get into the larynx and even these, these large beginning bronchi, we're going to have this type of epithelium pseudo-stratified. You remember what that means? Why is it pseudo-stratified? Pseudo's fake, right? It looks like it's stratified, but every single cell touches the what? Basement membrane. <clears throat> okay? And you can kind of see that in this one a little bit. Looks like these nuclei are at different levels, but they're really all touching the basement membrane. They're going to be columnar, so tall. It's thicker. But there's a real important part of this, ciliated. Now, we're going to look at what that silly, silly, silly stuff, cilia does in our respiratory tract, and it is extremely important. I don't know that we mention it here, but you see these little things? Do you remember what those cells are called? Goblet cells. And what do goblet cells make? Mucus. Mucus. So the mucus, along with the cilia, are going to play an incredibly important role in our airway. It's going to help keep everything clean, and it's going to help get the garbage out. And we'll see how that works in a little bit. So as we go down, like our blood vessels, our arteries, as we go further and further away from the heart, the vessels get smaller and smaller in diameter. Every time there's a branch, you're going to get smaller and smaller. And so as we get smaller, we're going to reach a point where we've got simple columnar that's going to be ciliated. And we're going to find that all the way down to some of our larger bronchioles. Again, there's so many generations of branches. We just kind of need to follow the pathway from pseudostratified to simple columnar, but we still have cilia. Then we get to ciliated simple cuboidal. 
This is going to be one of the rare places you're ever going to find simple cuboidal and the only place you're going to find simple cuboidal that has any cilia on it. And as you get closer and closer to those alveoli where we're exchanging gases, the cilia is going to disappear altogether. Uh, simple cuboidal and then simple squamous. These really flat fried eggs because we have to have that thin of a membrane for the gases to diffuse across. Remember our endothelium in the capillary is what type of epithelium? In our capillaries, what type of epithelium? We call it endothelium, but what type Relaxing? do we have? Y'all are, y'all are, this is AMP1 first unit. Oh, like squamous? Like simple squamous. squamous, yeah. Your capillary endothelium is simple squamous. So your respiratory medium is going to be capillary simple squamous and alveolar simple squamous right up against each other. And that's how thin that membrane is going to be for the gases to move across it. So let's examine some of these places. And again, we're going to start at the top and work our way down. And so the first place where air is going to enter the body, if not through the mouth, is going to be through the nose. Now, I, I, again, I, I know I shocked y'all by saying I was in track ever because y'all know I hate running. <laughs> but I remember practicing for high school football in the late fall because we always made the playoffs and it would be really cold. And if you ever been outside on a cold day doing something real active and you're breathing hard and that cold air just burns your lungs well the coaches would always tell us breathe through your nose breathe through your nose and I always always look at the coaches and say don't make us run don't make us run that'll solve the problem too because I couldn't get enough air in breathing through my nose but your nose because of how it's designed, it's designed to warm and humidify the air. And one way your nasal passages are designed to do that is inside your nasal passages you have these ridges of tissue. And these ridges of tissue are called concha. I actually got on Google for the pronunciation because I don't think I've ever pronounced these right in my whole career. Concha and if you put an E on it for plural, it's conchi. I don't know why it changes so much. So concha is singular, and you have three of them. And all together, they are conchi. That's the pronunciation according to Google pronunciate. But when you have these ridges of your nasal mucosa, that epithelium that we have, what are the ridges doing? What's the increasing the surface area to warm and humidify the air that's coming in. You're warming it because of all the capillaries that are in or just under in that lamina propria in that area. If you have more epithelium, you're going to have more lamina propria. You're going to have more blood vessels to warm the inhale there. All right, still in our nasal cavity. We've got these concha, and there are three of them. And, and you've got these, these ridges and the folds between where the air can move. You also have on either side of your face and around the nasal cavity, you have these sinuses. Typically, these are spaces within the bone of your skull. And so you have the frontal. If you've ever had that sinus headache right there, oh, yeah. it just kind of makes you squint. That's the frontal sinus. You have the ethmoid, do you remember the ethmoid bone? Did y'all get that in the skull? Okay, so that's the ethmoidal sinus. The sphenoidal, the sphenoid bone, and then you got the maxillary, and the maxillary is gonna be over here on the side. Now, moving on down. So leaving the nasal passage, we're not dealing with the oral cavity right now, but as we move down, we get to this part, and, and I just call this the back of our throat. And when we get to the orange part right here, that's going to be the pharynx. It's just posterior to that nasal cavity, meaning in this direction. And it's divided into these three regions. So notice they're all pharynx, right? So naso, of course, is going to be nasal. Oropharynx, what's that associated with? 
oral cavity, and then laryngopharynx, the larynx, which is going to be just below. That's, that's how these regions are named. So the nasopharynx is going to have your typical, what is referred to as respiratory epithelium. If you ever hear someone talking about respiratory epithelium, you know immediately they're talking about pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. Now, when I teach my histology class, I, I don't ever say pseudostratified columnar because there's never a pseudostratified cuboidal or pseudostratified squamous. Only pseudostratified is columnar, so it's almost repetitive terms. So if you say pseudostratified ciliated epithelium, there's only one thing it can be. And that's your absolutely characteristic respiratory epithelium. And you find that in the nasopharynx. Now also considered to be part of the nasopharynx, as my daughters when they were little used to say, the hangy downy thing. You know what I'm talking about? That's the uvula. Now, this is going to be an extension of the soft palate. The roof of your mouth here that separates your nasopharynx, your, your nasal passageway from the oral cavity, you've got the hard palate in front, that's the extension of the maxilla, and then you've got this soft palate in the back with the uvula where you have these two portions of the soft palate coming together and sticking down. This is supposed to be like a guard block food or, or stuff from getting into your throat too quickly or too excessively. I had a canker sore on my uvula once. I have never felt such pain in my life. Have you ever tried to touch your uvula? So uh, there's canker sore medicine that I use periodically. So I put some of the medicine on a Q-tip and I went to touch the uvula. First of all, it was like, hua, hua. but how many people have tried to take a toy away from a two-year-old? Okay, that is nothing compared to trying to hit that uvula because it moves. When I would get close and know, it would, it's almost impossible. So the gag reflex is a part of the, the uvula to put the medicine, the canker sore medicine, on the canker sore that was on the uvula. I don't know. I felt like I had razor blades in the back of my throat. It was awful. It was awful. You said it's composed of two different parts hanging down together. What? Okay, so two different parts hanging down. All right, so let me step back a little bit. Let's go back to when we were embryos, okay? In your embryonic development, there is a stage where your nasal passage and your oral cavity is one big cavity. And from the side, you start growing in these palatoglossal shelves. Wow, I remembered that. I didn't even look it up. I hadn't taught developmental in five years. Palatoglossal shelves, they grow in from the side. And they start partitioning off your oral cavity. Now, when you're starting, your, this, this one cavity is kind of small and your tongue is really, really big, taking up most of the space. That's why they have to start from the side. Well, they grow in, and as they're growing in, this cavity is getting larger and larger until finally your tongue is small enough, it drops out of the way, and the shelves snap together in the middle to form your soft palate. And so half of your uvula comes from this shelf, the other half comes from this shelf, and they're, they're kind of stitched together. And you can feel the stitching that stitched those two together. It's called your palatine rafe, R-A-P-H-E. Run your tongue along the roof of your mouth. You feel that line right down the middle? That's where the two shelves stitched themselves together when you were an embryo. So what in that process would cause cleft palate? So, oh, man. Cleft palate and cleft lip are related. Does the tongue just not drop in time or drop too fast? No. <sighs> this, is, this is a whole lecture on face development in developmental biology. Your face develops from five primordia. You have the frontal prominence, you have two maxillary prominences, and you have 
Uh, and you have the mandibular. And I think you've got a nasal prominence. There's a bunch of prominences. You, you, your face comes together like this. It closes up. And as these are growing in, they're pushing what starts to grow into your nose, these nasal prominences, together. And this tissue in your nasal prominence, right and left, and your maxillary right and left, as they're pushing together, they have to seal up right here. This is called the frenulum of your lip. And if for some reason they don't come together correctly, or you don't have enough tissue that comes together, you can have a clefting in your maxilla, the bone. It's not, it's not just the lip is clefted, your lip and your maxilla is clefted. And if, if, if that happens with enough tissue, you're gonna have the cleft lip, the maxilla, which is also gonna affect your hard palate inside. When is that the biggest problem? When you're a baby. When you're a baby and you're trying to breastfeed, you can't get a vacuum. And as you're, as you're trying to suckle on the milk, if you've got that clefting, the milk is also going up into your nasal passages. Because what do babies do that we can't do anymore? Oh, they can eat and breathe at the same time. They can drink the milk and breathe through their nose at the same time. <laughs> really? So nasopharynx, uh, we're also going to see that uh, you have this connection in this part of your face where you connect to your inner ear. This is called the eustachian tube. Mm -hmm. And you're glad you have this because this eustachian tube that's in your inner ear, that allows you to equalize the pressure in the outer ear canal with the air pressure from your mouth behind the eardrum. Because uh, who played drums in the band? Okay, when you're playing drums in the band, if you want to mute the sound of the drum, what do you do with your hand? You put it down on the, the drum head, and it mutes the sound. Well, that's like having high pressure pushing on your eardrum from the outside, or high pressure pushing out. And how do you equalize the pressure if you're diving or if you're in an airplane? You chew gum. That's one way, but when you're chewing gum, you're opening and closing that eustachian tube more. When you hold your nose and blow, you're putting higher pressure in the eustachian tube and behind the eardrum to equalize the pressure in both places. Oh, so that Sometimes if you do that, you'll feel it pop. Isn't that bad? No. Well, don't blow so hard you blow it out. I don't think you will, but I, I know... When, when I've gone diving before or been in an airplane, when I do that and I feel it and everything gets louder again, it, it's like I'll do that and go, oh, oh, it feels better. When you do that when you're diving, doesn't it allow the water to go inside your ear, though? Like, no. It doesn't. It's called the Valsalvo maneuver. Interesting. Yes, you close, yes. You close your nose I, think, your I think we've got that coming up as well, Valsalvo maneuver. Um, okay, so in the nasopharynx, or near the auditory tube, and I actually wasn't aware of this until I started putting this together, we have some tubal tonsils. I'd never heard of those before. And then, of course, we know our pharyngeal tonsils, right? What are they called? Pharyngeal tonsils? Adenoids. We know about those. Those are associated with the nasopharynx versus the oropharynx. That's our purple region here, right in the back of the throat. Now, here we've gone from our typical respiratory epithelium. What is our typical respiratory epithelium? What type? Pseudostratified ciliated. Don't forget the ciliated. Pseudostratified ciliated epithelium. You can put columnar in or not. It's your choice. But now we're going to have non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium in the oropharynx. Where else do we have non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium? Skin? No. That's keratinized. Non-keratinized. Mouth. Mouth, yeah. So this is continuous with the oral cavity. So we've gone from a typical respiratory here to an oral type epithelium because what are we going to encounter coming from the mouth? Food, water, a lot of stuff. 
So we need this thicker, more protective layer. And because it's non-keratinized, we're going to have growing cells replenishing themselves all the time. And it's going to be slick because we need that stuff to slide down pretty quickly. Now, our two tonsils in the oropharynx, palatines, routine tonsils we have to get yanked out every now and then. And then the linguals, those are going to be at uh, the base of the tongue on each side. And we know about those from lymphatics. All right, laryngopharynx. Still, we've got that same typical oral epithelium going on. We're still moving food and air through that. And then we get to the larynx. Now, this laryngopharynx and larynx, I, I can see its positioning, but I, I don't particularly care that they've included the epiglottis in this region because the epiglottis is really going to direct food from the laryngopharynx into the proper passageway once we get to the larynx. Because this flap that's going to be just, you see how it's just, you see it projecting up at the top of what we consider the larynx. What does is, what is epi, the prefix, mean? Above. In this case, what does glottis mean? Glottis is a hole. And in this case, the hole that the glottis is referring to is the opening of your trachea. So epiglottis is above the opening of the trachea. And so what's going to happen with this opening, and here you see the trachea down below, I, I wish that they had the, the esophagus pictured uh, in this one. But your larynx and your trachea are going to be in this ventral position. Do y'all call this ventral or anterior? anterior? I like to call it ventral. But anyway, anterior. The way I remember that is if you watch movies or programs and someone is choking and they have to do an emergency tracheotomy, they just put the, the, they do the incision here. You don't have to worry about anything else. The esophagus is behind or more dorsal to the trachea. And so when you think about, you've got your trachea, this tube in front, and your esophagus behind it. All right? So as you swallow or drinking something, you got two ways you can go. All right? But in the larynx of this part, it's basically, I don't have enough hands. Okay, we'll say, we'll say this is your trachea, and you've got the epiglottis right here. You better put that back. What happens when you swallow, the epiglottis goes down over the glottis of your trachea and it makes a ramp. So when the food hits it, it slides down the epiglottis right into the esophagus. Now, it's not 100% effective, right? Have you ever, my dad used to do this all the time. Have you ever been trying to eat or drink and then somebody say something funny? and then you start coughing and it comes out your nose and ears and everything else. So it's not 100% effective, but that's the function of the epiglottis to direct material from going into the trachea to go into the esophagus. In the larynx also, this is where we're going to have our vocal cords. And uh, there's that valsalva maneuver where you can put your nose together and blow and increase that pressure. Um, it's really pretty cool when you look at your vocal cords. So trachea, this is going to be the first part of what I consider your real duct work. You have one trachea. And in your single trachea, you are going to have um, cartilage rings surrounding the trachea. This is going to make sure that your trachea doesn't collapse. But your trachea, can it, the cartilage rings are also uh, a little bit like uh, a bow and arrow. You got the bow that's not really flexible and you can pull the string. And when you pull the string, the ends of the bow close off. Your tracheal C ring cartilages are kind of like the bow. But you also have, uh, we'll get to it in a minute, you've also got a muscle that is attached to the ends of the C-shaped rings, and they can pull those 
cartilage rings closer together. Now what's going to happen when that muscle pulls on those cartilage rings? What's happening to the diameter of the trachea? It's becoming constricted. Why would you want to constrict your airway? Uh, that you don't want to do that. The, so like physiologically, why, why are you needing to restrict your airway? If something bad in the air, you don't want to get it. If something bad is in there, not, not you don't want it to get in, it's already coming in. You don't want any more to get, get it. stuck? To get it stuck? We're getting warmer. You don't want it to get out. You, you need it to get out. Oh, to go back and just... You constrict the air... And when you constrict it and you force air through it, air pressure. air's going to be moving faster. So wh when's the time that you really move air fast through your airway? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't cough on you. So those rings constrict so that when your diaphragm forces the air up, it's going to be moving as fast as possible. And, and of course, when we vocalize, when we sing, that's also going to be controlled there as well. So this, this is part of your larynx, and it is cartilage. So in the trachea, when we look at its, its sort of design here, the bottom of the trachea, or inferior, that's where we're going to split. It's going to go from a one-way highway here, or, well, two-lane, I guess, in and out. And we're going to bifurcate into two. That is typically referred to as the carina, right here at the bottom. Right here. That's going to be the carina right there at the bottom. This whole thing is the trachea. That's the carina of the trachea before we split into our primary bronchi. Okay? And again, if you start getting something tickling down here, that's when you're going to cough. And that reflex is going to constrict those trachealis muscles. Those are going to be the ones that connect the ends of the C-shaped cartilages. They're going to constrict, and that's going to cause the air to move much faster through and up out of the lungs. And whatever might be down in there, you want that stuff to come out. So the tracheous muscles are on the back side of the ring. On the so if you, if you see the C-shaped ring like this, the tracheous muscle connects the arms or the points. Like, like this. Well, yeah, like this. And so when that muscle that's your two fingers, yes. when it contracts, it pulls the C more closed, okay. and then how does it open back up? It relaxes. The muscle relaxes, and your cartilage rings are hyaline cartilage. It's a hydrostatic organ, and they just bounce back. Yes. They reflexively bounce back. So you only have to exert that energy to close it, and then you've got a potential energy now to just relax the muscle and let it expand back to its normal position. Right. So we're at the trachea. This is generation zero of our branches of our airways. Bless you. And when we get past the trachea, now we're going to split, bifurcate into right and left primary bronchi. And that is our first generation. That's G1. Singular is bronchus. Plural is bronchi. You may hear people say bronchi. I've, I've never really, I, I prefer bronchi because it helps me know how to spell it. Each bronchus enters the lung. And this is going to happen on this medial surface. The sort of indented part of each lung is referred to as a hilum, like we saw the hilum of a lymph node, the hilum of the spleen. The, uh, each lung sort of has a hilum here. And so each bronchus goes to serve its own lung. <coughs> now, when we talk about clinical situations, kids are always putting things in their mouth. People are aspirating things. And when material is aspirated and it goes past the trachea, if it gets that far down to the level of our primary bronchus, objects are more likely to become lodged or obstructing the right primary bronchus. Why would it be more likely to have an obstruction on the right than on the left? Let's think about the anatomy 
of our lungs. Think about the anatomy of our thoracic cavity. Because it's bigger. What's bigger? The right side. Is why, why is the right bronchus bigger? Because you have the heart on the left side. Your lungs on the right have more lung tissue. They're bigger. They can exchange more gas because you see the indention right there in the left lung? What's, what sits right there? The heart. So your left lung has left surface area. So the diameter of the right bronchus is larger and more likely stuff goes into the right side. So, and depending on the size of the material, it could go left or right, but there's going to be a size material that can't go in the left that can still go in the right, and that gives it greater opportunity. Oh, so you're saying that even though like the right is larger, because it is larger, it attracts more airflow. Yeah, we're talking about being obstructed, meaning this object will go into the bronchus and get stuck. Yeah, but if the left is smaller, isn't it more likely to get sm stuck? In uh, if it if it is smaller and it gets well, if it's small enough to go in either one, then it's going to go in either one and it'll get stuck at some point. But you're gonna have an object a size such that it can't go in the left, but it could still go so in the, the right, right. The right bronchus has more opportunity. To Correct. Be Correct. How does the uh, body get rid of like food that goes into the trachea? Coughing. I mean, you cough it up. And, you know, uh, again, that's your natural response uh, if you can't get it up, then depending on how big this object is or how much food or, or stuff you got in there, you got to have help. You know, if it's not a lot, if you get some fluid or something in there, then your body's going to be able to reabsorb some over time. It's just going to depend how much and how big. Yeah, so, so, so protocol for drowning victims is really, like, neat because, you know, even though they do have a lot of fluid, it's just to give them, like, positive pressure ventilation. Mm -hmm. Because you're eventually going to just push it to the alveoles and it'll filter it out. Yeah. So. Uh, here's an example. Okay. Um, how many of you were born? Yeah. Uh, all of us. All of us. All of us were born. Uh, when you when you are when you are first delivered, what are your lungs completely filled with? Amniotic, Amniotic fluid. You have been breathing water for the better part of probably, I don't know, probably the better part of six months. You've been breathing water, which means ventilating. You're not exchanging gas. That's not what the amniotic fluid is doing. Literally what the amniotic fluid is doing, one of the roles of the amniotic fluid is to train your muscles. Which is harder to move, air or water? Water's more dense. So all this time, the baby in the womb breathing this liquid in and out, it's like your diaphragm and your intercostals lifting weights. Because how long do you have before you got to use them during birth? You, yeah, you, don't, you, don't, you can't wait. You can't say, ah, can I go back and train a little bit longer? I'm, I'm not quite, my muscles just, nope. You got that quick one. They clamp off the umbilical cord, you better start. So... For removing that material, a lot of it is, for lack of a better word, ladies, I'm sorry, a lot of the fluid in the baby's lungs is squeezed out during vaginal birth. I mean, is there a difference in them and C-section? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're going to get a whole lot more fluid squeezed out of the lungs, squeezing through the 10 centimeter opening, the Oz of the cervix. C-section, they're not being squeezed. And so one of the first things that you will see, and often in a vaginal delivery, they will deliver the head first, and then ladies get ready. Sometimes they stop as soon as the head's there, and they are aspirating in the nose, in the mouth, big time. <laughs> you know that thing at the dentist office? <laughs> well, they're doing the nose and the mouth and the throat, trying to get as much fluid out as possible. After delivery, your lungs, I think it's estimated, are a third still filled with fluid that the capillaries in the lungs do fairly quickly yeah. reabsorb. Well, like you also do want to do suction yeah. as well. So between suction and positive pressure ventilation. Mm -hmm. Now, you've, al you've always seen in the movies and stuff, especially the older ones, I don't know if they do it much these days, but when the doctor delivers the baby, they hold the baby upside down, and what do they do? Shake it. Spank them. Right? What did the baby do to deserve a spanking? 
Nothing. Nothing. But your lungs are a third filled with water. And so if you've ever been around a toddler that does not get their way in the store, just, just watch. No, no, no. Just, just, they're going to cry. They're going to pitch a fit. But when a toddler starts to cry, do toddlers go, hey, hey, hey. No, this is how a baby cries. Okay, you ready? This is how a baby cries. Watch. <gasps> so what did they do first? They inflate their lungs. So the spanking is trying to get the baby to go, <gasps> and fully inflate their lungs with oxygen for the very first time. 